Hello, hello. It's been quite a while since I've done a video. It was volleyball season and I was coaching, so it's been a busy time. But I'm back to it and let's get to it. All right, Genesis. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep doing that. So many Genesis. We're on Exodus 13. All right, so this is the firstborn set apart or the consecration of the firstborn or the dedication of the firstborn. And basically, we're just getting past. They've escaped from Pharaoh. They've run away, run away from Pharaoh. <clears throat> and now we're just getting into the Israelites beginning their own country. I mean, they don't really become a nation for quite a while, but this is the beginnings of it. They're no longer uh, slaves or forced indentured servitudes, whatever you want to call them, forced labor for Egypt. Remember, this crushed Egypt. This crushes them, not only economically because it was their labor force, uh, their free labor force, uh, but also militarily. And when the, Egypt, the Israelites left Egypt, they took a lot of the wealth with them. Remember, God said that the people of Israel were to go to ask Egyptians for, th for things, and he would make the Egyptians favorable among them. You know, and it might have been because they feared all these Plagues were coming on and they feared them. It might have been because a lot, it was starting to become obvious to Pharaoh's advisors and probably to the people at large that Pharaoh was in the wrong. So a lot of people might have actually felt sorry for the Israelites and gave them stuff for their journey for that case. But then Pharaoh changes his mind, chases them down, remember, and his armies are crushed in the Red Sea. They're destroyed. So Egypt's economy, labor force, wealth, and military power has taken all huge blows now. So Egypt is not really something that is going to be a concern for them for quite some time now. Now they're moving into the land of the Canaanites, which many powerful civilizations exist. And these were, uh, the Canaanites were the Phoenicians of old. <clears throat> Giants. You know, they, they actually, many believe they became the mound builders uh, with here in the Ohio River Valleys of America that we keep finding giant bones in. And it was known among the Greeks that these Phoenicians were super tall. They were like super tall sailor warrior people. But consecration of the firstborn. Now, I already went over this with Abraham and Isaac. But remember, all these other, not all of them, but a lot of these other groups around the Canaanite area, they were worshipping to Moloch, who they literally passed their firstborn through the fire. They burnt offering. They burnt their fir a literal firstborn. And there's some idiots who will read this, obviously not read the full chapters I'm about to, and they'll think that, see, this is the, the Israelites were dedicating their firstborn too. But see what it says. All right, read the whole thing in context. That's important. Exodus 13, 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The firstborn offspring of every womb among the Israelites belong to me, whether human or animal. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Don't eat yeast. The unfilling ingredient that makes it go bad quickly. Just like all sin, yeast is a representation of sin. Remember that. It's a quick fix that doesn't really fill you up and actually spoils things when it's left in there. Verse 4. Today in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You must keep the ordinance at the appointed time year after year. You know, there's a lot of people who will say you don't need church 
to have faith. And that's totally true. You know, you don't necessarily need church. You do need Christ. You need God. But what I find that's so valuable about church itself is the traditions. Holding on to those traditions to, as a reminder of the past, a reminder of the past of what we've come through and what God has done for us. I've often said, you know, you talk to people who want evidence or proof of God. The sky, everywhere across the world, the sky could light up and there could be a booming voice that says, I am the Lord God, your creator, and my son Christ was sent to die and pay the price for your sins. Worship him and have no other gods. Right away, people would be like, oh, it's a government conspiracy, it's chemtrails. Let alone 50 years from now, people would be like, yeah, Grandpa, sure there was a voice in the sky. People wouldn't believe it even then. How much proof does God have to give? He's given proof and proof and proof and proof. Eventually, it's up to us to remember it or to pass it on to our descendants. And this is why God makes them celebrate the Passover, makes them celebrate you know, these commemorative moments. Why dedicate your son? Because you need to make sure that the future generations remember what happened and why. Remember what happened and why. And I notice that this is a celebration. At the end of the seven days, after eating nothing but yeast, remember, no yeast is to be found among you. No sin is to be found among you. Then you have a celebration at the end, a party, a, party, a festival. So... Let's think back here. This is going to be something that kids will remember. It'll be a tradition. It'll be a happy memory. And they'll want to know what the background of it is. And it's right here said that you are to tell your children that this is what happened. God saved us from the Egyptians, from slavery. He brought us out with a mighty hand. He separated the waters. He put down the plagues to bring us to the land of milk and honey. Our God that we worship, and this is why we worship him, and blah, 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 blah. So it's a reminder of something God did for you. Traditions are important in that sense. But, so right now, this is what I find funny. Currently, in Israel, I don't know if it's once a year or how often it is. I think it's at once a year. They have a six minutes where everyone in the country has to like stop what they're doing and just six minutes of silence for the ones that the Jewish people that they lost in the Holocaust. Okay. Now, it's only Israel that does this. It's not all Jews that do this. But, and it kind of goes back to their traditions. But you see how after Christ, a lot of the Jewish traditions were inverted. Here, they're celebrating something glorious to remember, something glorious and awe-inspiring, the miracle of God that saved them. That's what they're celebrating. Now they are, and it's in order to remember what happened and why it happened and God's amazing grace and God's amazing power. It is to remember. Now they have a ceremony to remember, but it's to remember something tragic, something awful. You see how it's been inverted? Instead of remembering glory and awe-inspiring graciousness of God, now it's remember the tragedy and the victimhood and the terribleness that we went through. So it's like they've held on to their culture, but in such an inverted way. It's very interesting because this is their culture to remember things and to celebrate them and to always hold on to them. I mean, they still celebrate Passover and everything to this day, thousands of years later. But again, it's no longer celebrating the glory. It's celebrating the victimhood, the tragedy. It's very inverted, and it's because with the rejection of Christ, the rejection of the truth, the rejection of God's truth in this world. So that's why it'll always appear to be inverted. All right, verse 11. After the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised an oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over the Lord the first offspring of every womb. Earlier said the first male offspring. I think they're just short it up and assuming that that's known. All the firstborn, here we go. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among you, among your sons. Now what's this mean? First, The firstborn calf, the firstborn lamb, firstborn, you know, whatever is to be a burnt offering, a sacrifice to God. 
Now, why is this? Well, first of all, there's lots of different reasons. The first one is just showing that you trust in the Lord that he will provide for you. Because here you have a, a male, which is how you will continue your herd because that will become a bull, which will then be able to breed with the future heifers or whatever, whatever, whatever. But by burning it, you're showing material things are worthless and everything comes from you, God. I know you will continue to provide for me. So this offering, of course, goes to you and it goes to you willingly. Because I know that you will continue to provide for me. And also, remember, this is a big sacrifice because more so than gold and silver, a person's wealth at this time was largely based on their uh, assets. And livestock was a huge asset. Now notice that donkeys you can redeem with a lamb. So your firstborn donkey, you can sacrifice the lamb instead because donkeys are a beast of burden. And it's looked at differently under uh, a Jewish law. But the same thing goes for your firstborn son. Again, this is where those people like, see, the Jews were sacrificing their firstborn sons because they read like the first two lines. Of, this is true. People do this. The first two verses of chapter 13. And they don't get to the second part here of chapter 13 where it explains how to do it. In verse 13 of chapter 13 where it says to redeem every firstborn among your sons with a lamb. You're not actually sacrificing your firstborn. What's it mean for your firstborn to be dedicated? It means you are specifically with him, hopefully with all your kids, but specifically with that firstborn. You're teaching them the history and the truth and the power and the glory of God so that they will carry it on to the future generations. Because the firstborn son oftentimes then becomes the patriarch of the family going forward. So you really want that patriarch to have a firm foundation and dedication to the Lord so that he continues to teach the future generations of the Lord. So you're ensuring that the eldest son is dedicated in understanding of the Lord. He is the Lord's because he will become the patriarch of the family going forward and he will be sure to make sure that the future generations, his current generation, is aware of the power and the glory of the Lord. And again, you redeem it with a lamb, the sacrificial lamb. Verse 14. In days to come, when your sons ask you, what does this mean? Say to him with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the, Pharaoh, the firstborn of both people and animal in Egypt. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the firstborn male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons and it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the lord brought us out of egypt with his mighty hand again celebrating their salvation i'm not going to go back into it. i've done it already in my earlier videos about the firstborn sons being killed in Egypt, and everyone's like, what a wrathful, vengeful God. I'm not going to go into the whole explanation of why it's not wrathful, it's not vengeful, it's justice, and you can't logically make an argument against it if you actually want to look at the facts. If you want to be ignorant of the facts and just hate God because you have personal daddy issues, then that's your business. That's fine. It's, a, it's your decision. But if you want to have a real conversation about it with the facts, it's clearly a justifiable thing. Not only because it's God, but because of everything that had been led up to that point. Every opportunity Pharaoh had been given to say no. And the way the Egyptians had sunk into depravity. So now you are to ensure that your sons are aware of what happened why it happened and how it happened in the mighty hand of God that saved you and your people. These are why traditions are important. Real traditions. Traditions based on real events. Not traditions made up from mythology and made up out of thin air just to make kids feel good. Real, real traditions. You know, like with Christmas, my parents didn't like not talk about Santa, like Santa, we had some Santa stuff and we had our stockings filled, but it was always the primary focus of Christmas was Christ. It was Christ, you know, we were celebrating Christ's birthday. My parents made it clear to us that Christ wasn't really born on December 25th. That's just when we celebrate his birth uh, from a young age. But they also made it primary that this is about Christ. And it was 
whatever we talked about Santa, they made it pretty clear that Santa was just for fun, for kids. Even when I was a kid, it was obvious with them that it's about this. And that's what these traditions with the ancient Jewish people are about. The real life stories of what happened, why they happened, and the glory of God. Make sure the future generations are aware of them. Traditions, traditions, traditions. Crossing the sea, verse 17. When the Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. So, obviously, you know, this is written later on later by Moses. But Moses had direct conversations with God. And my guess is he probably was in prayer or something, talking to God, you know, like, why don't we take the quick route? And God explained to him that, you know, he doesn't want them to fall into despair, basically. If they go straight into war with the Philistines, then they might kind of be disheartened and want to run back to the safety of Egypt. But God does not have that intention for them. He wants them to take this land of milk and honey, not only because it's promised to them, but it's a very strategically important place to spread the message of Christ when Christ is to come. It's right on the Mediterranean, where it's the center of the known world at that time. Trade, everything is coming through there. The Silk Road comes in through there. So merchants, everything, this is the hubbub, the center. Okay, so this is where it needs to be located. This religion needs to thrive here. Christ needs to be here. This is where we need to set up shop. So he doesn't want them to be disheartened by war as soon as they get out of Egypt and go running back to Egypt. So he just has them take the long way. Though they did leave Egypt ready for battle. Remember it says that. Verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph, of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. He wanted to be buried with his forefathers. After leaving Sukkoth, they, capture, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so they that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. See, that's what's always crazy to me. Everyone talks about Moses and the party of the seas and how, wow, what a miracle. They're marching through the desert, and they have a pillar of cloud in front of them during the day so as to obscure people, so people won't see them. The Philistines, they're marching through this dangerous land with some pretty not good rulers or civilizations that probably will, would kill them and raid them on sight. You know, even if they didn't kill them, a lot of the stragglers would have been raided. The pillar of cloud by day hides them. It keeps them hidden. It's like a mist, like a fog that protects them from people seeing them. The pillar of fire by night lights their way, but also would scare the bejesus out of anybody who saw this pillar of fire that's just leading these people through. Especially when you hear like, oh, these are the Israelites. These are the ones that brought the, their God brought a plague down upon Egypt, the most powerful civil, civilization ever. Oh, uh, yeah, let's leave these guys alone. They got a freaking pillar of fire leading them. <laughs> Okay, so it's protection as well as serving a purpose. Now, that's the end of chapter 13. It's not, it's more just setting up things, letting you know what's happening. Again, a lot of the scriptures are just straight up history books. Like, this is what we did, and then we did this, and then we ate that, and this is why we ate it. And it's not necessarily everything's Daniel and the lion's den, super exciting. But at the same time, it kind of is. I mean, talking about a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud, all this stuff. But the main thing in this that I always get out of chapter 13 of Exodus is the importance of tradition. The importance of ensuring that the next generation is aware of where they come from and why they come from there. And not just, they need to be aware of the hard times, but you celebrate the good times. You don't live in memorance and woe over the hard times 
like some people do today in a victim mentality. You celebrate the good times. They celebrate how God kept, brought them out of slavery. They don't sit and mourn and have a week long eating unleavened bread because we were once slaves and we need to remember how we suffered as slaves. No, they remember how God saved them from slavery, brought them out of slavery. This is what they are to remember. It's a celebration of the good, of overcoming the bad. It, don't sit and live in victim mentality and woe. Like, oh, what was me? What was me? I was once, my ancestors were slaves. We should always remember we slaves. My ancestors were genocided. We should always remember the genocide. Every civilization going back was a slave. Every civilization going back was genocided in some way. Celebrate what God's glory has done, not what the evil one has done. Celebrate victory, not victimhood. Exodus 13. Love it or leave it. All right. Everyone have a great day and God bless.